Thank you for joining me today in the garden. I'm Liz Davey and you're watching NCTV Norfolk Community Television and it's in Norfolk, Massachusetts. I'm in my herb garden today and uh, it's dry, very dry. I don't think we've had a good rain for two months here. There's been rain around us, but none of it has happened to fall on this area. So the gardens are all very dry. We are also under a severe water shortage and caution is needed in doing any watering. So I do some watering, but it all has to be handheld or carried. And I've only been able in the herb garden just to do the pots. And these are things, uh, mostly plants that will be coming in for the winter. This is a bay leaf, which has done extremely well. And that will be coming in for the winter. I'll probably cut some of it down to harvest. I have enough bay leaves, I think, for the rest of my life on that one plant. Uh, the other thing I have is a rosemary. And again, I give that a little water every couple days just to keep it going. Basically, the idea is to keep the plants alive. The rest of the plants, it looks like fall. Actually, uh, this is just mid-August, but the leaves are starting to fall off the trees because they're dry and the trees are conserving their energy by dropping leaves. The same is true of the plants. The leaves are shriveling up and falling off. Hopefully the roots of these uh, various plants will stay healthy and will be back again next year in, case, in the case of the perennials. I put in a few new plants, annual plants or tender plants this year, and I have tried to give those a little water every other day or every third day, again, just to keep them alive so that I can take cuttings to bring in for the winter in the house and save them over for next year. Last year it was a little too wet, this year it is much too dry. Hopefully next year we'll have a year that is just perfect with the right amount of rain and the right amount of heat. We've had a number of 90 degree plus days and it has taken a toll on all the gardens and particularly the lawns. The lawns go dormant. Uh, everybody has a brown lawn unless they have a watering system and uh, most people have been encouraged not even to use their watering system if possible to save the aquifer that's under all of our land and provides the water that we need for drinking and bathing. I am going to pick a few things here. It's interesting that you can see what things actually don't mind the dry, hot conditions. And the oregano's in bloom. It's smaller than it should be. All of the herbs pretty much are smaller than they should be. Some have gone into quite a decline. Others haven't been too bad. This is southern wood, and I'm going to pick a little of some of these herbs just to make a bouquet to put uh, out in my shed or into a closet. And these will prevent insects like moths or at least deter them. And I'm also going to use rue. And the rue is in pretty good shape. It did flower, short, sort of. It's not as uh, vibrant as it once was. You do need to be careful with rue if you have sensitive skin because it can, if you get the sap on you, be phototoxic, meaning that you can get a rash just from handling the plant. I don't tend to be sensitive to it, but I am reasonably careful with it. I won't rub it all over my skin. Other things are pretty dry. The rosemary is quite happy. It's gotten a little water, but it still likes that Mediterranean heat and sun. Thymes. I've got some nice uh, lemon thyme down here. I have other thymes in other areas of the garden. And it seems quite happy with the conditions of not getting any water and with uh, just surviving the summer. The winter savory isn't doing too badly either. The tansy has suffered, but I can still pick a little of it and put it into my bouquet. Uh, it is another one of the herbs with a lot of scent. And then I'll just take a rubber band and band those together. Most of the culinary herbs that I have wanted to dry, I've already picked. In fact, I'd already done so a month ago, so I'm not too worried about that. I can come out and get a bit of this and a bit of that if I'm doing some cooking. 
Oh, I can still pick a few chives, although they're going fast. They've uh, turned very brown. The lemon verbena is not too unhappy. And the stevia is pretty unhappy, but uh, it's still a little green. Now let's move over to the dry perennial garden. This area of the perennial garden is extremely dry. I have not been able to water it, and the plants here are very unhappy. Uh, the only thing that's flourishing right now are the potted plants, which I have watered, and that would be the pineapple lilies. And those will come in for the winter, so I do want to keep them going as long as possible. And then we'll let them go dormant in another month or so. But these are some things that would be blooming in the fall if they survive. And the, this is a Eupatorium chocolate with nice dark leaves. However, they're very wilty at this point. And it's just extremely dry underfoot. Most of the things in here have already bloomed. I also have a uh, Montauk daisy. This too would, would bloom in the fall. I'm not sure we'll get any blooms from either of these two plants, which would be what I would expect to fill out and bloom in the fall in this area. The lilies have bloomed and I've cut off the tops. Anything that's completely gone and uh, have totally brown leaves and I know is good done for the season has been cut. And that would include this foxglove, which will need to be cut all the way to the ground. I've already cut the tops off with the seed heads and spread them around so that perhaps we'll get some next year. But this one, I'll, I'll just cut this one back. There's no sense saving it. The same is true for this plant which is also very brown. So we can get ahead a little bit on our fall cleanup by cutting back the things that have already gone by. Even the artemisia is suffering in the heat, and that's usually one that does pretty well in hot conditions and dry conditions, but this is extreme. Moving down a little ways and over to another section, we have some more native plants in here. I still have some potted plants, but the butterfly weed, which is a native, is doing surprisingly well for getting little or no water. And it's forming its seed pods, and this will be opening up and the seed pods will be spreading their seeds, or I can save those seeds to share with someone or to replant. I have a rose bush here that, again, is getting little or no water unless I bring a watering can over and it would usually put on a nice uh, fall flush of blooms. I don't expect it will this year. It's just too dry. I have some uh, artemisia in back, the gray, gray flowering foliage, and that hasn't spread a whole lot this year. Usually it, it does, but at least it is still gray, and it is uh, at least alive, and hopefully will thrive. I did transplant a uh, hydrangea in this area and I think I lost it. I don't believe it's going to make it. I just was not able to give it enough water. The same is true of the pineapple sage and the lemongrass. Again, they should be twice or three times the size they are right now, but they need water. Uh, even this set of Black-eyed Susans is pretty dry. This area is one of the sunniest areas and also one of the driest areas as far as dry soil goes. There's a gravel base underneath, which is very nice when we put in our septic system, but it's not very good for holding any water. Of course, this year I also did not mulch, which I usually do. I decided I would skip the mulch this year, and that was probably not a very good decision because that would have held in some of the moisture. As I move over this way, I have a native aster, and it's doing pretty well. Again, the native plants have been done much better in these conditions, and it makes me want to add more natives and uh, take out some of the other plants that don't do too well in extreme conditions. I also have a sedum in here, and sedum is a succulent, and succulents do well in the drought as well. So again, this one could be divided next spring, and uh, I think I will do that because it's doing pretty well, and I'll probably move some of that up into the drier area. 
and perhaps even uh, some of this aster, which will be blooming in another month. It may not bloom as much because of the drought, but at least it's staying alive. The peonies, of course, have deep roots and they also will stay alive. I've been watering my clematis. It's a rather expensive plant to lose and trying to keep it at least alive. I don't expect any further bloom. I've also put out a little dish here and I try to keep some water in it. It's dried up already since this morning. And it's for any small birds and butterflies. They need water too. I've got a couple bird baths and I've been trying to keep them filled. All of the brooks and other areas around are very dry. The uh, brook that's behind my house is completely dried up. Uh, the wet area is completely dry. And so the wildlife that depended on that water now has none. So any water that I have here can help them make it through too. This is Alium, and it's uh, Alium Millennium. And right now it's feeding the bees like crazy. I've got bumblebees and honeybees and a variety of native bees all feeding on the pollen from the Alium. It seems to also really not mind hot, dry weather. This area of my garden has gotten a little more water it also gets a little more morning shade. And that has helped it uh, by getting a little bit of shade and some moisture from when the uh, vegetables are watered. I'm watering those with the hose and I can get a little water over here. I've got some uh, oryngium and uh, it's spiky foliage, that's doing quite well. And coming down this way, we have some white phlox, a few daisies, and another native plant, which is a ironweed. And this is uh, in bud, and it will soon have bright blue flowers. And it seems to love this weather. Uh, I put it in last year, it didn't do that well when it was wet, but this year it certainly is. The monarda, over here still has a few uh, pink sporadic blooms. I did have been deadheading it regularly. That means cutting off any blooms after they're gone. I've been trying to pull some of the dead areas out of the day lilies. Again, the day lilies are finished for the season. They can even be cut back all the way if, once they turn brown. We have a few uh, very wilty black-eyed Susans still in bloom and they do add some welcome color to the garden. A few platycodon have come out. The deer, or I'm sorry, the rabbits have eaten most of my balloon flower or platycodon. There's a sporadic blue bloom here and there. They're very short. Not only has the drought made them short, but the rabbits did a little pruning early in the season, which uh, helped keep them very short. Usually they are three or four feet tall. More sedum up this way, and another aster. I've got some fall asters, and uh, hopefully, eventually, we will get some rain, and we will see some things in bloom. I have a couple chrysanthemums in the garden that are budded. The asters have some buds, and hopefully in another month, if we get rain, we'll have a few blooms for fall. Uh, we keep hearing forecasts of rain on the way, uh, including some that was supposed to come today. And by the time it gets close, the forecast changes and again, no rain. So we're really, really into drought. The grasses have done well. I have several grasses in the garden. Again, something else I might wanna add. I don't know if uh, all my plants will survive this. If they don't, I will look at it as an opportunity to add some of the things that will survive drier weather because I'm afraid that's what's in our future. Verbena bonariensis is this little purple flower and it spreads. I have some here and there around the garden and I will probably collect some seeds for this when it goes. And a native lupin and it too is doing pretty well with minimal water and it is a native 
And again, it's the natives that seem to be doing the best, which uh, bodes well for planting more natives. As I come up here, I've had poppies in bloom. There's the remnants of one right here, but I let the poppies uh, go to seed, and uh, then I can shake them out over a cup, and sometimes even the smallest poppy seed has some seeds. And we have more poppies here and there, back here. There's some behind the fence. And we get a few seeds. And poppy seeds are so tiny that uh, a few seeds is all I really need to start some for next year. The other thing I might want is to get some seeds from this uh, beryngium. And I can either shake it or cut them off. And it might be wise to cut them off and then shake it well and get the seeds out of the heads. And again, either spread those around the garden so they can come up next year, or save the seeds to be planted in the spring, or to use for winter seeding, which we'll do indoors and bring them out. But it's time to collect any seeds that you want. That about does it for this garden. Now let's go down into the vegetable garden, which is fair better. I've concentrated much of my watering efforts on the vegetable garden because that's what we eat. And so I, it's nice to have flowers, but the vegetables are a little more important for daily life. And some of the vegetables, like the peas, have been taken up. The onions have been pulled. The garlic has all been pulled, and we'll show that in a little while. But the onions, I'm doing what's called field curing, since we're having these warm, sunny days. I just put them in the basket to stay out here in the sun. And in a couple days, these were picked last week, pulled. And in a couple days, I will bring them in, uh, cut off any tops that are still on the onions, and put them in a bag and store them, in probably in my garage, which tends to stay a little cooler. I also put my garlic there. I did plant a little pumpkin here in hopes that we would get some good rain. It, it's growing, but I don't know that I'll get any pumpkins from it. They were going to be small pumpkins, so it depends how long we go without frost and if we do get rain. There's plenty of dill, and most of this dill reseeded from last year, and I've been picking it and using it, and we'll have plenty of dill seed, which will spread itself throughout the garden, and we'll have lots of dill coming up next spring. My raspberry crop was pretty much a failure between the chipmunks and the dry weather. I didn't get many raspberries, maybe a handful or two. That was it. Uh, now it'll be time to go in and take out any of the fruiting canes, which are the ones that are dark, and those will be burned. And I will mulch the raspberry patch with straw for the winter and hope again that we get a little better season next year. A couple years ago I had raspberries enough to freeze, but not this year. You never know. Our strawberry crop was good this year, so we can be thankful for that. It's time to plant some second crops, and I've got a new crop of arugula, a little bit of kale of two different kinds, and I planted a broccoli plant that I got at the farmer's market. My broccoli and most of my herbs have not done really well. I've gotten parsley, and the parsley is growing, but the dill and the basil just really never did well at all this year. Uh, parsley I will harvest enough to keep in the refrigerator. The celery we've been using, but again, it, it would like a lot of water, and it's, the stems are a little tough, but it's still edible, so we're having celery. And I have a few peppers. Some of them are now turning red on the uh, meager plants. The plants have not done extremely well. The Brussels sprouts are doing well. And the cabbages and the parasacaba, which is a uh, 
type of like broccolini and it has done all right in this. Uh, I'm hoping to get some Brussels sprouts. I've been spraying with a, an organic spray. Uh, you may see some white butterflies flying around and those are the ones who are responsible for the holes in these crops, but I do spray them and uh, so far they haven't been a uh, big pressure on the crops. We've been picking, I've picked broccoli enough, had enough broccoli to put some in the freezer for winter. And now I left the plants there and now the areas where the broccoli was cut will form sprouts. And the sprouted broccoli will be small heads. They won't be like the, the large heads, but there will be enough small heads to use into fall. In fact, if we make it through to fall with the plants getting some water, we should have, it on the cooler days, broccoli and any of these crops are very hardy, and we should have a lot of fall broccoli to use. And the Brussels sprouts should form sprouts. They form their sprouts between the leaves on the stalk, and they're starting to form at this point. In another month, we'll take the tops out of the, bro of the Brussels sprouts, and then it will use all its energy to go into the little sprouts. I like to have flowers among my uh, vegetables and this year usually I have a profusion of zinnias and cosmos, marigolds. This year not so much. Uh, the plants are here, they've got lots of buds. Uh, the same with the uh, dahlias that are planted by the fence but it, they're, they've been so dry that they haven't flowered as well as they usually do. Uh, I do give them a little water, but not enough, not enough. Uh, you really can't give plants enough with just a handheld hose. My little cucumber towers have been producing pretty well, enough that uh, we've had plenty of cucumbers to eat, and I've made numerous jars of refrigerator pickles, which we'll do again when we go inside. I have a couple cabbages and I picked one about a month ago. Uh, I grew a variety that does not get large. They're a mini cabbage and I cut an X. Once I'd cut the head, cut an X in the stem where it's been cut and now I'm getting four tiny cabbages in place of it. So I will possibly have some tiny cabbages to harvest a little later. Some of the lettuce is now ready to be pulled and uh, some is still, it, I can still use. There's some that's still green and I have a red lettuce that is a, a slow maturing variety that I can still uh, pick and use in salads. It looks pretty nice with some of the tomatoes. The tomatoes have done quite well. Uh, my tomatoes are of different varieties. I use for different things. Uh, some of them we just eat sliced, others I will dry for winter, and some we've used in, in cooking. So I have different kinds for different purposes. My tomatillo, usually by now the tomatillo is dripping with fruit. Uh, not so much this year. I thought it would like these dry conditions and hot weather. Hot weather it not likes, but it doesn't like it quite this dry. It is a more southern plant uh, for salsa. And uh, it may have some blooms later on and fruit, but I've only picked a couple tomatillo from it this year. At the end of my rows up at the top, and uh, we can possibly get a picture later, I did plant some straw flowers. And that seemed to be a good decision because they do like it hot and dry. And they're already forming at the top little uh, clusters of straw flowers that I can pick as everlastings and bring in for winter winter use. They're, they're little and you do need to put a wire on each one, but they're kind of fun to grow and have some dried flowers, or you can use them in a wreath or to add to a wreath. Again, the flowers, I've had enough for a few bouquets uh, whenever I want one, but not as many as I usually do. I have planted some more lettuce and I planted some spinach, fall spinach. Uh, the important thing with that is to keep it damp until it sprouts 
So I've been out here watering this morning and night, and as you can see, it's already dry, even from a watering this morning. And that would be this row at this point. I've saved a spot for another row, which I'll, I might try later. I've never done really well with fall plantings, but if we start to get some rain, that might change. This is a plant called an amaranth, and I didn't plant it uh, this year. I planted it probably 10 years ago, and I have it coming up all over the garden in the spring. I usually leave one or two of them because I like the way it looks, and it really is pretty in uh, flower arrangements. It seems to like the dry weather as well. Amaranth is a grain, and if I shake one of these top blooms, you can see the grain coming off of it, and uh, you can find amaranth at a health food store. This one is a more decorative variety. It's called Hopi Red Dye, which gives an indication of one of its uses, which is as a dye plant for fabrics. And also, in a vase, if you put it in a clear vase, the uh, color will leach out and you'll have pink water in your vase. Now let's head back over to some of my potted plants. Window boxes are very hard to keep alive if they aren't very deep, and these are certainly not very deep, so they, uh, they require watering quite frequently. Every other day at least, uh, every day is preferable. Fortunately, this area does get some shade, so it isn't quite as bad. I've got a pepper plant that I put in the middle, and those are going to turn red, which I thought would be nice for fall. Uh, I have a verbena and a petunia, mini petunia, in this particular box. And I've also planted some, uh, you know, maybe I didn't plant it in here, uh, other flowers in here. Sometimes I put in marigolds. At any rate, uh, it requires a lot of water. If you go away on vacation, that can be a big problem. One of the things you can do is fill a, a bottle with water, a soda bottle, a wine bottle, fill it with water, and then with the water in it, turn it upside down in the middle of your container. And the water will then slowly come out. At least that's the plan. And help keep the area watered. It's particularly good if you have one particular plant, like I want to keep this pepper going. So I'll probably fill one with water and put it there. The other thing that's hard to keep going are hanging plants, and especially when the temperature was in the 90s. This one really suffered. It came back a bit uh, this last week, and I had a lot of blooms, and now it'll probably come back again. I've been pulling off the dead portions and cutting back some of the stems. <coughs> one of the things I can do to help rejuvenate it is to put it in a tub of water <coughs> and just uh, let the water seep into it. If you're going away for a weekend or a week, you can put water in the bottom and put it out of the direct sun. Maybe a little sun is okay, but leave it in the water while you're gone. It will at least keep it alive. The shade garden has fared a little better. This area tends to be a little damp anyway. Believe it or not, I have not watered this area, uh, except for the potted plants, of which there are several. This is a begonia, which is grown for foliage primarily, and uh, every spring I'm ready to put it in the compost because it does not fare well over the winter, and I have two of them. Uh, they tend to get a little uh, white fly, and they just are not great winter plants. However, once I put them out for the summer, they really fill in nicely, so it's worth keeping them over the winter another year, I think. Uh, once things are gone in this garden, and this is a bleeding heart, which bloomed beautifully in the spring, but now its time is over. And I'll just cut that back all the way to the ground. I'll probably leave the support here so that I'll remember that something is planted in this area. But the uh, stems will just be composted. There, it already looks better without it. 
and I'll clean up the leaves that are left a little bit later. But uh, it did not need to add to the picture. The hostas have done pretty well in this area, and the Gila boars are still green. They've kind of spread out. They look a little thirsty, but they are alive. I've cut off all their former blooms, blooms uh, which were black, and the leaves on those bloom stalks do turn black. So that helps a little too. Coming down this way, again, the hostas that I have bloom at various times. Some of them have already bloomed, the ones up in the area closest to the camera. But I have some that are starting to bloom now. This is one called sea octopus, and it has a darker purple bloom. And it's just blooming now. Once the hosta has bloomed, I cut off the bloom stalks. I don't leave them. Uh, I would prefer to have the energy go into the plant itself rather than into the dead blooms. My pool is, pond is looking a little murky. Every bit of wildlife in this area, I think, is drinking from this pond. And I have a ton of frogs in here. One day I counted 21 frogs sitting on rocks around the pool or going into it. So it's kind of hard to keep up the pond. I've been adding the enzyme treatments, uh, and, but with the heat, it's just a little hard to keep up and clear it up. I need to uh, start washing the filter out about every day, and we will get it clear again, but today it's looking a little murky. My fish are still doing well. Uh, they're happy. And as I said, we have so many frogs in here. It's kind of adding to the burden, the, the uh, animal burden on the pond. Uh, I don't see a snake today, but we've also had a couple little snakes around, little garter snakes for the most part. And uh, they do scare you if you run into one when you don't expect it, but uh, I've made friends with them and they're harmless in this area, so they need to drink too. And again, I think a lot of birds have come down to drink. We have had them eating berries that soil the walk. So again, without rain, it doesn't get washed off as often. The plants have been doing pretty well. I do add my plant fertilizer about once a month to the elephant ears. Again, they're plants I bring in for the winter and they just about make it through. And then when I get them outside, they flourish. This plant is a uh, northern, uh, northern sea oats, northern blue oats, I'm sorry, and it is another grass that kind of likes shade. Uh, around some of the other areas I have carex, which is another shade grass, and those seem to be doing pretty well and not being too dry. I may have lost a couple other plants in this area. I have a rogersia and a curingshioma, which both have disappeared, and whether they'll come back next spring, I don't know. Time will only tell. Uh, watering them is not going to help. By the way, uh, this is not the time to fertilize your plants unless they're in pots that you regularly water, pots of annuals. Uh, it will not bring plants that are drought weakened back. Uh, roses particularly, don't fertilize them now. Even if they do grow and we get rain, you want them to start thinking about fall at this point. So fertilization, is not needed now. Save it for the spring. The garlic that we uh, harvested last month has been in the shed. And what I do with it is I left it in the shed, and I saved two of them out, to cure. This is so I can keep it for the winter. I'm gonna cut it off, and then I'll cut off the roots. And then I'll bag it. And if it's a little dirty, I use a scrub brush to scrub it off. Good, before I do that. And cut the roots and stem. into my storage spot in my garage. And this should last us most of, most all of the winter. And, and uh, because it's been cured, it won't sprout. 
and uh, we'll have a nice supply of garlic for the season. Because it is so dry in the garden, I decided that I might try sprouting some of the herbs that I missed because they didn't grow too well. So this is a bas some basil that I planted on the 12th, so about 10 days ago. And basically, it, just like I would have planted it in the spring, I'll keep water in the container around it and I'll put it in my shed. Now my shed has a plexiglass roof which lets the sun in. So I'll just set them in there and we'll see if we can get some to sprout. Once it does, depending on the weather, I'll either plant it in the garden for a fall crop or I'll put it in a pot and grow it either on the patio or bring it into the house so that I'll have some basil this fall to use. I also did cilantro and some uh, lettuce and thought I would try this. This is an experiment. I like to experiment in the garden. Another thing I experimented with this year is putting aluminum foil just a little bit around the base of each of my summer squash. Usually I have borers uh, get into the squash and at the stem at where it enters the earth and it kills the stem eventually. I read where you could put some foil around it and I thought why not give it a try. Well it's been somewhat successful. So I think I will probably continue doing that in the future. And I may try it on pumpkins and winter squash in another year too. Now let's head into the house and see what we can do with some of the things that we've been harvesting from the garden. August and September are the seasons to do a little preserving for things that you want to keep through the winter. Of course, we've been drying some herbs all along. I've already put some broccoli in the freezer. This year I blanched it, by, and by blanching, <clears throat> that stops the growth process. And I had quite a bit of broccoli, so I blanched it by putting it in boiling water for about two minutes and then emerging it in ice water to stop the cooking process. I used it, I froze some as spears, and most of it I froze as chopped broccoli because we like broccoli cheese soup. And it, I froze it in portions that I can use for that soup. And as well as casseroles that I can put it in too. It takes up a little less room when it's been chopped. I also did the same thing with green beans and wax beans. And I'm noticing that uh, I have another crop of green beans and wax beans on the plants and I will be picking more soon and probably will put those in the freezer as well. It's nice to have some things that you don't have to buy at the store. I'm also making pickles and these are for use in the near future because I also have made and preserved pickles. Uh, I did last year some uh, bread and butter pickles which I processed in a boiling water bath and I also have done relish which I again, processed in a boiling water bath so that they'll keep for several years. These pickles are meant to go in the refrigerator and to be consumed within the next month or so. And <clears throat> you'll notice I had two cucumber towers out there. One of them is pickling cucumbers and the other one is uh, slicing cucumbers. And what I'm going to do is I've already put some dill in the jar. Now the jar just came out of the dishwasher so it's very clean and my dishwasher does have a sterilization cycle. Otherwise I would rinse it well in boiling water. And what I'm going to do is cut up some of these cucumbers and put in many, as many in the jar as I can. Usually I cut them in halves or quarters. My husband really likes these and eats them almost as fast as I make them. And they've been washed and it's important to take off the blossom end. I usually cut off both ends, but uh, you definitely want to get the blossom end off or they will spoil very quickly. And I think we can probably get most all of these into the jar. They're easy enough to do. They just take a little time and effort. Again, this is a little guy which we can kind of poke in here and there. They can be packed fairly tight. And I think I can get more down here. There, we got them in. So there's a little room on the top. And I can get rid of the plate. 
Now we want to add a few things to the pickles and one of them will be pickling spice and I have new pickling spice here. Maybe I've got, I think I have one that is, no, I do, one that's open. And I'm going to add about a tablespoon, a little less than a tablespoon of pickling spice. And that's found at the, in the spice section. And we like a little crushed hot pepper. It gives them a little zip. So just a pinch of hot pepper. And garlic. And of course, you saw all that garlic I had, so now's the time to use it. And I do. And I've cut up a couple of uh, cloves of garlic, peeled and cut in pieces. And I'll kind of poke that down in where I can. You can chop it if you wish, or just leave it whole, or, or I tend to cut it in two or three pieces, each piece. And then we'll be using this a little later. And then I'll put more dill on top. And again, this is dill that I've cut from the garden, so. And then we need to make a brine. And I have boiled and cooled one quart of water. And to that, I'm going to add three quarters of a cup of uh, white vinegar. And salt. Oh, here it is. I'm using kosher salt. Or you could use pickling salt is also available if you do a lot of pickling. Most of the table salt does have some added anti-caking ingredients which can cause your uh, pickling solution to get uh, cloudy. So we added three tablespoons of salt. And I'll stir that up until the salt all dissolves. And that's just a simple brine. And I want to cover it. I want to make sure everything that's in there is covered or poked in so that you cover it, put it quite up to the top. Get things covered. And then I'm going to cover the top with a piece of plastic wrap. And we're going to set these aside. And I'll set them over here for now. But these set aside for three days at room temperature at which point you can cap them up with the uh, jar cover and put them in the refrigerator. But it's important to leave some air space a little bit or not cover them too tightly because they will do a little bubbling as they start the fermentation process. And the pickles will be done in three days. So you have to keep people from eating them before three days are up. And that's basic refrigerator pickles. Again, they stay out for three days, and then they go in the refrigerator, and they'll last in there for a couple months. Uh, the garlic, if you put a lot in, gets a little strong after the first two weeks, so best to consume them soon. The other thing I like to do is dry or roast some tomatoes, and these are little tomatoes that I have grown, and they're, uh, they were listed as particularly a good variety for roasting and drying. And I can't really sun dry them here. This is maybe, actually, maybe this year I could. You never know. Uh, it's been so hot and dry. But uh, I like to do it in the oven at about 250 degrees. And I don't dry them completely. I'll dry them until they're just kind of leathery. And I'm putting a little olive oil on them. They're much like the oil soaked, sun-dried tomatoes that you get in the store. And then I put a little garlic in with them to roast along with them. And usually I'll fill up the whole tray before I do a bunch of them. 
And this is it. Then I put them in a 250 oven, and I'm going to set that for about an hour. And then I'll look at them, and then I'll set it again. And uh, when they're the way I want them, I'll take them out, let them cool. And then I'll put them in, uh, excuse me, I need to wash the garlic off my hands. But I'll put them in a freezer container and store them in the freezer. They're not going to store at room temperature. And they aren't canned, so they, they could not be really processed any way that you could store them in the refrigerator. But in the freezer, they last pretty well, and you can take out a few if you need them. They're very nice mixed with pasta. In the middle of winter, you have that nice, fresh tomato taste. And they're easy enough to do if you have a lot of small tomatoes. Cherry tomatoes work. Uh, plum tomatoes work as well. They just take a little longer in the oven. And if you're doing, getting supper or doing something else, it's easy enough to put a tray of those in the oven and just let them do their uh, roasting, and then you have something to put in the freezer. The next thing I'm going to make is dessert. And what I'm going to make, this has been so hot lately, and I'm going to make some blueberry, or blueberry, yeah, um, peach buttermilk popsicles. And I've done the peaches, I'm going to put the majority of them in my processor. We'll leave a few out for a little later. And a quarter teaspoon of salt, three quarters of a cup of buttermilk, and a quarter cup heavy cream. And then we're going to spin that around. Oh, forgot the most important part. Half a cup of honey. Almost left it out. That gives them the sweetness. And also, we'll keep them from freezing too hard. We're going to process this until it's smooth. And the direction said to finally chop the rest of the peaches, but I thought, why not let the machine do it? So rather than finally chopping them, you want some chunkiness in it. So I'm just going to Chop a little more. And so we have some small pieces in mixed in. And now we need to put them in something. If I had one of the uh, lovely little popsicle containers that uh, you can freeze popsicles in, which I had when my kids were a lot younger, I would use those. But I don't. So I'm going to put my mixture into a measuring cup for easy pouring, easier pouring. And I'm going to use paper cups, little small bathroom paper cups instead. And I'm going to pour some of this mixture in. I had, did not know how much it would make, so we'll fill them up. And it's going to make about eight. easily. And clean up a little. And we don't need these cups, so we can put those away. And I don't have any popsicle sticks, but I do have some uh, lollipop sticks left over from making some cake pops. So I'm going to set the sticks in my popsicles. And this will go in the freezer a little later. And once they're frozen, we'll have popsicles. 
Uh, in order to get the cups off, we can run them under a little water if necessary, or just hold them in our hand. And the cup, they should come right out of the cups. So there's our, our peach buttermilk popsicles. And the next thing I'm going to make is a pasta primavera. And I'm going to start out by heating a tablespoon of oil. And then I've cut up a lot of vegetables from the garden. And this is a good way to use some of them and make a vegetarian meal as well. Although uh, this is not quite vegetarian because I'm using chicken broth. Yeah, I could use so uh, vegetable broth if I wanted to make it completely vegetarian, but it's uh, got a lot of vegetables. So we're heating our oil in the skillet. And the first thing I'm going to add is a carrot that's been sliced. And, and we're going to cook that for a minute or so. I sliced it very thin so that it would cook fairly fast. Now I'm going to add a half cup of broccoli cut in little bite-sized pieces. And this is a great use for those sprouts that I said you would get if you left your broccoli after the main crop and let it make new sprouts. And we're going to let that cook for about a minute. Stir it to coat it with the olive oil a little bit. And now I'll add... Uh, half cup of red pepper strips and we'll let that cook for a minute or so. Again, we want our vegetables to all be tender crisp, not uh, completely softened. Okay, now I'm going to put this mixture over into a bowl and let it sit for a little bit. my pan I'm going to add half teaspoon of oil and a bit of butter and let that melt and then I'll add about two ounces of mushrooms they were large so I cut them in half <coughs> sliced and a small zucchini, or a small yellow squash sliced, and two small, uh, small zucchini sliced. And I did peel my zucchini due to family preference. And we're going to saute that for about three minutes. A good way to use zucchini and yellow squash is to saute it in a little olive oil and butter. And then add some corn, which really uh, kind of complements it. Continue to saw that, saute that until the zucchini gets a little brown on the edges and is quite tender. And then uh, finish it off with a little bit of dill and perhaps uh, adding some uh, chopped onion at the beginning or garlic to spice it up a little. But that's a good way to use zucchini or yellow squash if you have a lot of it in your garden. It makes a, a nice side dish. Now we're ready to pour this in with the other vegetables. We have a lot of sautéed vegetables. Now we'll make a sauce to go with it. I'm going to turn my heat down just a little bit. And we're going to add half an onion chopped and two cloves of garlic against uh, minced. 
And I'm just going to cook that until it softens a little. And I think I'll add a little bit more olive oil to the pan. I just want this to get nice and soft. And I'm going to add a, about a three-eighths of a cup of chicken broth. Actually, this could be two tablespoons of wine and a quarter cup of chicken broth. And I'm going to cook this and scrape the pan to get any loose bits off the bottom of the pan, deglaze it. And we're going to cook this down for a couple minutes until it's about half. Now we've cooked that down until about half of the liquid has evaporated. And I'm going to add then a quarter cup of heavy cream. And a quarter cup of grated Parmesan cheese. And I'm going to stir this around until the cheese melts, which should be fairly quickly. At which point I'm going to add the vegetables that we sauteed. plus a quarter cup of frozen peas. And we'll stir that around. We have a very colorful mixture here. And heat it until it's hot. A lot of vegetables. And then I'm going to serve this over cooked pasta, which I had already cooked. few pieces of carrot and turn off the stove and then we're going to sprinkle it with some chopped basil and we can serve it with more of the Parmesan cheese. And the idea is uh, as we serve it we'll stir it into the pasta and that's our pasta primavera and with that I would serve some sliced cucumbers and tomatoes, and a little crusty bread to mop up some of the vegetable juices. Yeah. And we have our flower arrangement for the day. Oh, bits and pieces from the gardens. And let's see how those tomatoes are doing. They've started, but uh, I'll get them out just to Put them with everything else that we're working on, and then they'll go back in the oven. And we'll put them over here on the stove. And I want to thank you for joining me today. I'm Liz Davy, and you've been watching A Walk in the Garden at uh, my home here in Norfolk, Massachusetts, on NCTV, Norfolk Community Cable Television. Mm -hmm.